In this road, there lay so many dead rebels that they formed a line which one might have walked upon as far as I could see. They lay there just as they had been killed amid the blood which was soaking the earth. The wound had filled every building and overflowed into the country round, into farmhouses, barns, cornfields, cabins, wherever four walls and a roof were found together. September 16th, 1862. McClellan turns back Lee and his Confederates at the battle at Antietam Creek in the bloodiest day of the war. On the Union side, more than 12,000 men were dead, wounded, or missing. The South lost fewer men, nearly 11,000, but that number represented a quarter of its army. Upon entering the war, both the Union in the North and the Confederates in the South hoped it would end quickly. But the battle at Antietam Creek was just one bloody day among hundreds in America's Civil War, a war in which more than three million Americans fought a war in which more than 600,000 men, or 2% of the population, died. Nearly every Southern family lost a son, a brother, or a father. Americans displayed bravery and cruelty, ingenuity and poor judgment. The war was long and horrible, and it changed forever the lives of all who lived through it white and black soldiers, slaves, settlers in the West and Native Americans, professional women, and those who kept families together back home. Future years will never know the seething hell and the black infernal background, the countless minor scenes and interiors of the secession war, and it is best they should not. The real war will never get in the books. Walt Whitman. The Civil War began on April 12, 1861, when the Confederate Army began bombing Union troops at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. General Pierre G.T. Beauregard demanded that Major Robert Anderson and his Union troops withdraw from Confederate territory. Men and women watched from their rooftops as the shells screamed over Sumter. The attack at Fort Sumter followed decades of American unrest over slavery, states' rights, social values, and Western expansion. It had gotten so bad that politicians were coming to Congress with revolvers and knives in their briefcases, unwilling to compromise. Southerners feared that Abraham Lincoln, the newly elected president, would end slavery. So they seceded from the Union, elected their own president, Jefferson Davis, and wrote a Confederate constitution by the time shots were fired in Charleston Harbor, the Confederacy had seven states. America had become two countries, and Abraham Lincoln was going to put it back together again. Major Anderson and his troops withstood one day of intense cannon fire without injury. After 34 hours, Anderson surrendered Sumter. He returned north carrying a ragged flag. The victory cheered the South and set the North on fire. The shot-torn Sumter flag waved from the statue of George Washington in New York's Union Square. 100,000 New Yorkers surrounded it, demanding vengeance. So impatient did I become for starting that I felt like a thousand pins were pricking me in every part of my body and started off a week in advance of my brothers. Frank P. Peake, Arkansas. Lincoln immediately ordered states to send 75,000 men to serve as federal troops. Patriots rallied to the cause, but his call put four more states into the Southern Confederacy, and Jefferson Davis arranged to move the Confederate capital from Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. At its beginning, the aims of the war were simple. The Confederacy would fight for independence, the North to reestablish the Union 
but young men enlisted for many different reasons. Some for conscience, some for adventure, some for honor. If a fellow wants to go with a girl now, he had better enlist. The girls sing, I am bound to be a soldier's wife or die an old maid. Private Theodore Upton, 100th Indiana. I tell the boys right to their face, I'm in the war for the freedom of the slave. When they talk about saving the Union, I tell them that is Dutch to me. I'm for helping the slaves if the Union goes to smash. Chancy Cook, Wisconsin. Men streamed in with an assortment of gaudy and impractical uniforms. The first wave came as 90-day volunteers, another as three-year volunteers. They elected their first leaders from among themselves. Most had no military experience. Amateurs led amateurs. When they arrived at camps, generals who had never led such large groups were expected to put together troops from these undisciplined civilians. Neither North nor South was ready for war. Both sides looked for leaders among career soldiers, many of whom had studied together at West Point and other institutions. They were classmates and friends. Robert E. Lee was first choice for leading the Union Army, but when his home state of Virginia seceded, he accepted Jefferson Davis's request to lead the armies of the Confederacy. Abraham Lincoln would struggle with lesser generals for three years until he found a match for Lee in Ulysses S. Grant. Northern officers like William Tecumseh Sherman warned their Confederate friends that they were bound to fail. The North had 18 million people. The South had only 9 million. One third of those were slaves. 90% of the country's manufacturing took place in the North. Two thirds of the nation's rail lines and most of the iron, coal, copper, and precious metals were there. Northern trade with Europe was strong. It had cash for war supplies. But the South had its own advantages. Southern soldiers knew what they were fighting for, to protect their homeland. And they knew the country they had to defend. Northerners had to invade and conquer unknown ground. Men fall, their bleeding torn and mangled, the smoke, dust, wild talk shouting, hissing, howling, explosions. It was a new, strange, unanticipated experience to the soldiers of both armies, far different from what they thought it would be. Charles Coffin. After the attack at Fort Sumter, enthusiastic new soldiers waited impatiently to see action. It came for many at Bull Run, only 25 miles from Washington, D.C. Union troops headed for Richmond in summer heat. Confederate troops sent them running. When the battle was over, some 3,500 men lay dead or wounded. Another 1,300 were missing. The Union retreated. The South claimed a victory and boasted the battle had secured their independence. Lincoln quickly appointed General George B. McClellan to lead the Union Army, who organized, drilled, and equipped a formidable force of a quarter million men. The soldiers must be fed and clothed. They must have guns, cartridge boxes, knapsacks, tents, and wagons. For the closing of the southern seaports, ships must be built. Never before was there such a commotion in the northern states. Charles Coffin. During the Civil War, Americans in both the North and South applied their technological genius to the weapons of war. The Civil War witnessed the introduction of railroad artillery military telegraph and railroads, landmines and telescopic sites, and ironclad ships. Lincoln found the new gadgets fascinating. He encouraged balloons for battlefield observations, tested new rifles, and encouraged inventors. McClellan's army became the best equipped in history. New developments in firearms design improved accuracy and range enabling soldiers to pick off oncoming troops from a long distance. The Spencer repeating carbine, which could fire seven shots in less than 30 seconds, issued devastating blankets of fire. 
Battlefield casualties were horrendous. Soon the rifle and the trench ruled Civil War battlefields. Lincoln may have entered the Civil War to preserve the Union, but no matter how he defined the North's objectives, this was a war about slavery. The Civil War was about both Union and slavery. It was first about Union because the South had seceded from the Union and went its own way. And if you were going to restore the Union, you had to keep the Union uppermost in people's minds. Most Northerners would fight for Union. Because of racism, they were not willing yet to fight against slavery, although in time, they came to hate slavery because slavery strengthened the Southerners. Driven by the need for freedom, the war was transformed into a war for union with no slavery, a war to, in effect, have government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but now a people that would include all rather than just some. Free blacks offering to fight were turned away from recruiting offices and told that this was a white man's war. Free blacks contribute by constantly petitioning both Congress and the President um, for the right to serve as soldiers in the Army um, and for a clear statement from the President on what the fate of the slaves will be in the event of a Union victory. Frederick Douglass is very eloquent and very important in this movement. He besieges Lincoln. He's in Lincoln's office three, four, five times in those three years, demanding the right of black men to serve in the Army and speaking in public, saying things like, there is no population in the country that loathes the slaveholders more than the slaves. Unleash the mighty power of black resentment. Slaves working back on the farms and in the factories made it possible for Southern whites to fight in the field. To break the Confederate war machine, Lincoln realized he would have to raise the stakes. With the first big Union victory at Antietam, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation declaring that all slaves still held by enemies of the Union would be free as of January 1st, 1863. Soon after, the Union Army allowed black men to fight for freedom. While the proclamation was a great step forward, it did not end slavery, for it allowed slaveholders in border states faithful to the Union to keep their slaves. Slavery would not finally end until ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution in 1865. But the first great step had been taken, and the next seemed sure to follow. Black men and women took to the streets cheering Lincoln. The proclamation meant the North was no longer fighting just for the Union. It was fighting for the establishment of a nation without slavery. Southern slaves decided to emancipate themselves by running away to Union lines by the tens of thousands. African Americans began fighting in the Civil War almost from the beginning of the Civil War, even though they were not formally recruited. And a remarkable experiment was launched there known as the Port Royal Experiment to answer every question that white people in the North might have had about slaves. Would they work without compulsion? If freed, would they go and attack white people? If they had to defend themselves, would they do so, or would they shrink back in fear? In order to protect this experiment, it was necessary to arm some slaves, in effect, to give them uniforms. And this was the first South Carolina regiment. This isn't the regiment you see in the movie Glory. That comes later. The first regiment was actually made up of slaves whose status as slaves or free people was not even assured. This is before the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862. So blacks were fighting from the very beginning. But it wasn't until after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued that it became uh, legally possible to enroll blacks in the military. And roughly about 200,000 blacks served in the Ar Union Army and Navy before the war was over. Absolutely essential to Union victory. Frederick Douglass rejoiced when blacks could enlist. He sent two of his own sons. But he believed the restriction against black officers was wrong. It is a little cruel to say to the black soldier that he shall not rise to be an officer of the United States, whatever may be his merit. But I see that coupled with this disadvantage, colored men should hail the opportunity of getting on the United States uniform as a great advantage. May 27, 1863. Black troops charged the Confederate fortifications at Port Hudson, Louisiana. 
multiple times they charge into intense rebel fire and each time they are repelled. Seeing black soldiers' courage in battle helped change people's minds.